Okay, so here we go. And it looks like we've got about, I don't know, 20 people, something like that, maybe a little more. There's a couple of names on there that don't have, that I guess they're just on audio, and that's okay. So, welcome to the world in 60 minutes. This is an online presentation by Pan Am Dragon Boat Coaches and Friends for Pan Am Campers. My name is Pat Bradley. I'm the camp director and head coach for Pan Am Camps and Clinics in Tampa, Florida. This is my Florida-based staff. If you've ever been to a Tampa camp, you'll know that these guys are pretty critical to the operation of the camp. Paddle the World in 60 Minutes is going to keep Dragon Boaters from around the world connected to our wonderful sport by providing online training, editorials, opinions, um, even some entertainment, uh, hopefully, during these times of confinement. Our team of coaches, our international coaches and guests, are going to deliver three short presentations in each of our one-hour episodes. And it's going to be live on Fridays at 11. Zoom invitations to our meetings will be posted on the Pan Am website and Facebook, Feed International, as well as Flying Fish. Sessions are going to be limited to 100 guests and presenters because that's the way Zoom operates. Um, so we recommend that you get on, join the waiting room, um, get in there early, join the waiting room um, before the session starts to make sure you get a spot. If the session is full, and we're hoping that it's going to grow, but uh, 100 people is a lot of people. If the session is full, you'll get a notice on your monitor that says the session is full. Um, the sessions are going to be recorded and offered at later dates on, uh, on YouTube. I need to emphasize, if you haven't figured it out by now, that we're not broadcast journalists. We're coaches, and this program is an experiment. It's an offering from a group of dedicated coaches and special guests that we're gonna have from around the world. <clears throat> so, what do we got for you today? Today's program features, and you've already heard from them, uh, Tim Smith, the flying Englishman from Stony Stratford in England. He's also a Pan Am coach and coaches the uh, Premier, or the Senior A national team in England. He's gonna talk about shoulder, uh, shoulder health and shoulder conditioning. And that deserves a lot of attention because that is our joint, a joint that just takes a lot of abuse, a lot of stress and drag and move. So he's gonna talk more about conditioning and how to maintain health and prevent injury uh, for the shoulders. I will also be contributing to today's program with a presentation on mental toughness. Training your brain and heart for any eventuality is an important skill for athletes. Just like we need physical strengths and technical paddling skills, we need to train our minds to maintain focus under stress. That's what elite athletes do. That's why they're successful. Our third presenter, Garf Cooper, also in Florida. Garf is one of the most knowledgeable data paddle technicians in the planet. Garf's innovative technical assessment tool, it's a computerized paddle, uh, can be used by coaches to critique the paddling stroke and uh, and improve performance. So that's our presentation for that's going to be our uh, uh, our presentation for this morning. So now, um, I'm going to need you guys to. We're gonna, actually I'm going to mute. I'd like you all to mute yourselves. Okay, this is a pre this, this presentation is not interactive. You need to mute yourselves. If you want to connect with the presenter, um, you can always email us, connect with us on Facebook or whatever. Give us feedback, ask feedback or ask more questions. That, uh, that opportunity, be, opportunity is going to be there for all of you. <clears throat> but out of respect for your teammates, your classmates, uh, so that they, everybody can hear the presenters. And somebody's already mentioned that we're not that, uh, it needs to be a little uh, louder. So if we can minimize the noise in the background, that's awesome. So that means dogs, eating, whatever it is that you do that makes noise, okay? Um, all right, so I gotta launch this, uh, this ball. I gotta throw this across the ocean to Tim here, and uh, he's gonna take it away with our first presentation. Tim, are you ready to go? I'm ready, are you gonna change me to host? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I got this, Tim. You just have to catch the ball, all right? Well, I'm ready. All right. I don't know if I can throw that far. Come on. Okay, good morning to you. Oh, there we go. So, there we go. Welcome to Paddle World in 60 Minutes. Tim here, Tim the Flying Englishman, also known as the Glenohumeral Minstrel. 
Now what I mean by that, the glenohumeral joint with a sense, all delivered with a sense of humerus, if you get the pun. Anyway, so much of that. I'm going to talk to you about uh, shoulder conditioning, shoulder health, shoulder flexibility. Very, very important. I need to add, firstly, all of the stuff we're talking about is going to get downloaded or uploaded onto YouTube. So you've got a free resource there to refer to at any time, any time, day or night, and it's free and you're more than welcome to it. This and all the other content. Um, before we talk about shoulders, if you owned a really expensive machine, say a really expensive car, a Porsche or something, or a motorbike, would you leave it in your garage and not maintain it at all, and then maybe leave it there for a year, maybe there for six months, and then basically jump on the machine, jump in the car and drive and expect it to perform up to spec? Probably not. Well, you have here, here and here, two very complex, very intricate machines. They're called your shoulders, okay? Made up of bones, ligaments, and the amount of range of movement they've got is really quite phenomenal. And yet, very often we as paddlers don't look after our shoulders, and yet we still expect our shoulders to look after us. Let's just lose the hat for a minute. Now, if I said to you, for example, um, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, teres minor, teres major, what am I talking about? I'm talking Latin. Yes, I am. I'm talking about the rotator cuff. Each of those muscles occur or exist in your shoulders and do specific things which assist the vast array range of movements or abduction, uh, protraction, retraction, circumduction, all sorts of circumduction, all sorts of bizarre and interesting names which sum up the movements of the shoulder. Now, even though we don't exercise in all of that full range, we still need to maintain the shoulders. So if we come to need them, as in paddling, quite a complex maneuver, complex activity, they're ready to go and fit for purpose. If we don't look after them, same as your car in the garage, if you don't look after it, you don't maintain it or have it maintained, don't be surprised if it fails. Very often, from a coaching point of view, a coaching point of view, uh, if somebody's got a poor technique, uh, we would, or they get injuries, we sometimes blame the poor technique when in fact sometimes it's, it's far better looking at it and think, thinking, well yes, technique may be an issue, but sometimes it's down to lack of maintenance and lack of care and attention and the injury prevention side of things. So this is what this particular segment is all about. So we've talked about the anatomy, I don't go into great detail about it, and by the way, the other piece of muscle across the top of your shoulder is your deltoids. That's the one that comes over the top. Everyone's heard of that. And the, uh, the rotator cuff is just underneath that, okay, or superficial to that, so to speak. Okay, so that's so much, so much of the, uh, the anatomy and physiology. I'm going to show you a range of movements that I would suggest, really, I think they're daily movements. I do them every day. And all you need to start with is something as simple as a baseball, or I've got a, a hockey ball there, or a tennis ball, piece of fruit. Now the way to progress these exercises is in terms of start off simple, get the basic technique, and develop on in terms of doing the exercises for a longer period, or you could add uh, additional weight. Now, hold that thought for a minute. Some of the exercises I've moved on to developing and using with a four kilo kettlebell, but important point, Use these after you've got the basic technique. As we've said previously, myself, Pat, I am not a therapist, I am a personal trainer and I'm a coach. So if you had any particular pain, you need to identify that first. And let me just take you through that. Um, the way to identify if you had shoulder pain, you probably know anyway, but it's called a pain, painful arc exercise. So if you raise your arms, Okay, up over your head, you're in the frontal plane. Okay, this extension exercise. If between, so this is zero, this is 180. If you raise your, you raise your arms between 40 and 80 degrees, if you're experiencing pain, then what you really need to do is probably go and see, get some specialist help. The chances are you may have blown your um, supraspinatus. That's the little muscle that sits on top of the shoulder, this little tunnel. And that's the one that when people blow their rotator cuff, that's the one that tends to go. That's the one that's responsible for this um, adduction, abduction exercise, okay, or this manoeuvre. That's the first one. So if you're experiencing pain as you do that serious pain, then it's specialist help first rather than these exercises. The other one that specialists tend to uh, advise you to do is this 
back scratch exercise. If you're experiencing significant pain when you're trying to move your arm up your back, then once again, that might indicate a more deep seated problem, like I say. So this is just maintenance exercise and development exercises rather than remedial exercises for pre-existing conditions. Anyway, that said, let's move on to it. The movements, basically, I say basically a lot, this movement here, this is called circumduction. Um, your, your shoulders can um, elevate, they can depress, they can protract, they can retract, they can do all sorts of lateral movements, extensions, flexions, and all the rest of it. And like I say, we've got to look after these so the thing performs when you need it to, say in a race or in training or whatever your chosen sport is, in this case, drag boating. So let me take you through a series of exercises that I do that I find are helpful when I use them as a maintenance thing. Okay, the first one, very simple. When I warm up, I do jumping jacks, my favorite warming up exercise. But what I'm doing at the top, obviously at the bottom, I'm doing my normal jumping jacks, but at the top, I have five variations to that. The first one is a standard jumping jack. So my arms at the, in the frontal, so frontal um, plane, just coming up to the top. That's elevated, that's version number one. The second version is one to the front, one to the side, okay? Frontal plane, sagittal plane. And my arm, my legs are obviously jumping up as they normally do. Version three, two to the front, two to the top. So see what I'm doing? I'm warming up my body, jumping jack, but I'm also warming up my shoulder in its various planes of movement through its full function. That's three. Four is palm down to palm up. So I've got that extra rotation, that horizontal rotation. And number five, version five, is basically, as I'm doing the jumping jack, I'm just bringing my arms over, okay? So it's a bit like a jump rope or skipping rope. Now that's my warm up, and that also warms up the shoulder specifically. So that's that. The next one, the more specific shoulder exercises, two balls, and I'm doing circles, interlocking circles. But as I'm doing it, if you have a look, they interlock differently. My right arm's in front, my right arm's behind. So it's a normal frontal plane circle, but my arms are interlocking, and I can go the other way as well. Okay, that's a frontal plane. Same thing again, sagittal plane, and I can go the other way. And I, in fact, I can do contra-rotating as well. Same sort of thing, both directions. I can do doubles. So instead of doing a single circle, I can do double circles, a bit more of a core and hip flexor exercise, other way as well. And I can do figure of eights. So basically, single ball, and I'm describing a figure of eight. And as you see, I'm just warming up that uh, shoulder joint I don't need much weight, really. I could do it with a kettlebell, but something like a hockey ball is just ideal for the warming up side of things. And I can do double figure of eights once more. This brings in the hips as well as the shoulders. There we go, double figure of eights. Now, a bit more specialist. Can you see a U? Forget my head, you can see a U, can't you? As I rotate down, can you see an N? Yes, right. So basically, let me just drop one of the balls. Not the camera there, there we go. This arm, the upper arm is stationary. So what I'm looking to do is rotate around there. Okay. That's the movement I'm looking for. And from the side, I'm going from all the way back here. So I'm really pushing my chest out here to rotating down, so I'm almost tipping down, like I say, extending that full range of movement, mild discomfort rather than pain, nice and slow, and if I have more weight in my hand and I accentuate the stretch, you can spend quite a few dollars or pounds on a, a little rig to put around your chest to keep your shoulders back, but this actually, for the cost of two balls or two apples, does the same, if you do it regularly. So there's my my U to N. The next one, can you see an S? A square sort of S. Same sort of thing. And we're trying to keep our upper arms stationary. And I can really feel the stretch and the rotation. You probably see it on the camera. Going through my upper body, through my chest, 
really stretching off in one direction then the other just pushing to mild discomfort and just pushing that stretch a little bit developing the stretch there we go okay next one is a circumduction exercise circumduction is this exercise here okay so if i move back a bit if you see my fingers i'm describing little circles and just touching my thighs with my thumbs as it comes through and I get the circles bigger nice and slow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger gradually and I end up arms horizontal I then do what we used to call doorknobs okay so what I'm doing here is rotating all the way back and all the way forwards this horizontal rotation exercise keeping the arms up so do that for a period and then we go into opposition doorknobs so if you see there, I'm twisting in the opposite way, just stretching out the tendons, stretching out the ligaments, building some joint strength as well, promoting blood flow. And then when I've done that for a period, then I go down again. Okay, so if I've gone forward going up, I'm now going down again, down again, going opposite direction, and I end up doing little circles, once again, brushing the hips. So we've combined that horizontal rotation exercise with the circumduction to Maneuvers that you don't normally use in everyday life, but the, you still need to do those when you're maintaining your shoulders. So that's our, our circumduction door knobs. The next one, now I mentioned your shoulders are capable of some other uh, movements. Elevation and depression. Okay, elevation and depression. Protraction and retraction. Okay. So what we're looking to do here is describe a big square. You've probably gone to the gym and done shrugs. It's the same sort of thing and you can do it with weight as well. But this one is basically a um, elevate or up, forwards, protract, down, depress, back, retract. So the biggest uh, square, I was gonna say circle then, you can do very deliberate, Try and get that full range of movement. And do that maybe 10 times forwards and then reverse it. Once again, not an exercise we do a lot of, but we still need to exercise and maintain that range of movement. And then the shoulder will be in better condition for it. Very rich blood supply to your shoulder, by the way, so worth promoting that as well. So there we go. Now, last few, underarm tuck. So I've got the balls, could be, could be um, Indian clubs. And we're going from here, tucking under the shoulder, okay? So I'm trying to get this down and up as high as possible, okay? Underarm tuck, underarm tuck. And I can do same size as well. So nice and steady. Don't rush it. Get the full range of movement and press. But if it's painful, ease off, dial it back. So it's mild discomfort and you're developing the stretch. Underarm tucks, okay. Um, last few. In fact, last set. You've probably seen Conrad doing his teacup exercise. Okay, I call it a helix, because you're thinking, you're describing a figure of eight. So around there, okay, I call that the single helix, the teacup exercise. And then you go with the second arm, same thing again, so it comes under the arm, up, and you might find you have to lean back to do that. So we've got helix, underarm, Rotate, and you see how you're working your shoulder really great. You can feel it in your core as well. So that's a single helix. Then you can do a double helix. So imagine you've got a bar between them, or if it suits, you could hold them together. And you lead with one arm. So I'm going under, round, and up, and under, round, and up. In this case, I'm leading with the right hand. Okay, once I've done that, then I can go opposite way, leading with the left hand in this case. So this is a double helix. Big stretch. Last two, next one is called a Spanish dancer. So called because I thought about it in Spain, but that's the only Spanish connection. So if you think about it, single helix, and as it comes round, it knocks that one into a single and basically so it goes on i just tap the balls and balls kiss and off it goes again this becomes a bit of a hip flex warm up as well 
Okay, there's your Spanish dancer. And the last one for today is something I call the Manta. Have a think about this. So we're going an opposition helix. We're going round, up, and over. Round, up, and over. So it's a mirror image of the helix maneuver. So cool, because it looks to me like a Manta in full flight, I suppose is what the term is, because they have wings, don't they? Even though they're fish. Okay, and there we go. Now that's my selection of, my favorite in fact, but my selection of shoulder, not so much rehabilitation, rehabilitation certainly, but maintenance, development, um, exercises that keep your shoulders in the best possible health for paddling and paddling related activities. And actually, if you're sitting at a computer, they're pretty good for that as well. So they're good, as far as I'm concerned, everyday life exercises. Anyway, that's enough for me. Um, any questions, please come in, ask me the questions. Um, remember YouTube, so all this stuff is going onto YouTube as a continuing or permanent resource for you. And apart from that, I think that's about it. So there we go, Pat, are you ready? Are you ready? Here it comes. Okay, hello again, Tim here again. Now just while that ball is traveling back over to Pat, uh, I just needed to make a quick comment on tennis elbow. Reason being, Michael in Ireland has asked me to comment on this particular condition. Now, I'm gonna show you some exercises I did, because a few years ago, when I first started out with paddling, in fact, I had tennis elbow and golfer's elbow bow on both arms, okay? Now, this is what I did. These are the exercises I did and I found some relief. But like I say, if you had persistent pain in any joint, the first thing you need to do is go and see a therapist or a specialist. I'm a personal trainer and a coach, and these are just the exercises I did that helped me out during that period. If you're not familiar with it, tennis elbow is a pain you get on the outside of the arm, and golfer's elbow is on the inside of the arm. And if you have it on both arms, it's no joke. I got it from outrigger paddling when I started uh, steering outriggers. And when you think about it, you're hanging out the boat, really stressing and tensing those uh, tendons and stressing the tendons. Anyway, the exercises I did, and these, these are what helped me. Imagine this, so I've got my, my arm isolated either on a table or against my body. The first exercise, that I, exercise I did was basically, it's called a radial and ulnar deviation. So if you see how the way my hand is, it's basically stretching from this way to this way, inside to outside. I don't really want to do it extended arm because then I'm activating my shoulder. So isolate it so you're I just hand against the body. So it's a radial or ulnar flexion and extension. That's the first one. The second one was another flexion extension exercise. And it was basically from Stretching that way, but like I say, isolating the elbow, you can see that, and upwards, okay? And you'll find that if you make a fist going upwards, you've got more of a stretch, okay? Then going down, so try both. And the other is, if you turn it over, stretching that way, and you'll find that with an open hand, you get more of a stretch as it points up. So stretching that way, fist open, fist closed, just isolating that, nice and slow as you do it. Another exercise I found helped was basically going from supinate, pronated to supinated. Okay, so that's prone, that's supine. Now what I used was a dragon boat drumstick, something with a bit of weight on the top. Once again, isolating the elbow, and it was just rotating. You could do it without the weight if it's very painful, or I found that anyway, to start with. So I started off doing that nice and just stretching out the tendons. Then I added a weight. So you're stretching to mild discomfort again, maybe slower, and I developed on to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, don't go too heavy too soon. But what you're doing is with the extra weight on the end, you're giving it a bit more resistance and really stretching out those tendons. That's a uh, nine pound uh, Indian club, so don't go to that too early. Start off steady within your, your pain threshold and develop. And the last thing I did, I sort of discovered it by accident really, 
this is a, a resistance band. I've got the bottom end under my foot. And what I did basically was a bicep curl. I think a friend, either that or a friend uh, referred it to or, or recommended it. So you're isolating with a small resistance band. So once again, exercising within your pain threshold. Okay, just isolating this here. So you're controlling the range of movement. What really helped me more than anything else was absolute, absolute other abstinence and rest. So really, if you've got major pain, that's what we're gonna do. But like I say, I'm a, not a therapist, I'm a personal trainer and a coach. So if you have persistent pain in any joints, the first thing you need to do is go and get specialists to help. But those are exercises that helped me when I had that condition in both arms a few years ago. I hope that's of help, but uh, like I say, specialist help is where you need to go first if you've got persistent pain. Hopefully that ball's gonna to get to Pat in the next few minutes. Okay, see you later. Thank you. Got it. All right, thanks, Tim. I highly, I highly recommend that if you've got any questions about that, that is Tim's forte, the, the whole personal training aspect of it, and specifically, more specifically, preventing injury for adult athletes. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tim, that was awesome. Okay, so train your brain to control your emotions. As a teammate, we need you to be mentally and emotionally ready for any eventuality. We're counting on you to be calm and focused. Just do your job. That is your job, to be calm and focused. Mental toughness, as I mentioned before, is a skill set. It's a, it's, a, it's a critical piece of the athlete profile. So what I've prepared for you today is a mental toughness checklist to help you give that all-important psychological edge all right and i have a few anecdotes a few stories for you as well okay number one ego sensitivity accept who and what you are there's 20 people in a boat you're one person don't expect that you're going to get a ton of attention and everything's going to work out the way you want it to do your job smile and sit where you're told to sit perfect okay number two Know your body. You need to know the difference between pain and fatigue. Experienced athletes will know that. Inexperienced athletes, sometimes we're not sure. We get working really hard and we start to feel things, sensations in our body, and you might wonder, gee, am I, have I injured myself? You really have to figure that out, and through experience as an athlete, you will figure that out. If it's an injury, what do you do? You stop. If it's fatigue, if I'm your coach, I want to have you push forward a little bit more and try to just keep pushing that in and we're going to get stronger. Okay, so you really need to know your body. A quote I heard the other day, I was out for a run, it was part of a song. I love it. Uh, it says, if you start to taste weakness, anyway, okay, number three, um, planning. Another line I like is that if you're scared, like before a race, before a big event, if you're scared, you simply haven't prepared. Trust your training, trust your skill set, and be where your feet are. Don't be thinking about anything else. Your crew is counting on you for whatever period of time it is, um, and they expect you and deserve to have you at your best. Okay, um, power versus control. Actually, I want to go back to that one a bit in terms of the, uh, of the planning. There's basically two roles for an athlete, in my opinion, and not one is better than the other. <clears throat> They're both equal. One, obviously, is you want to be the best physically, mentally, technically that you can be to contribute to your team to make them better. But the other one, equally as important, in my opinion, is make your teammates better. What do you do to make your teammates better? Okay, be enthusiastic, be encouraging, all those kinds of things. That should be part of your plan, okay? Power versus control. Have you ever seen this, where the coach calls for a power series and instead of the boat surging forward, it blows up because everybody's out of stroke and everybody's trying to do it on their own, okay? 
you can't do it on your own. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to focus on technique and you can't let urgency cause you to blow up. You have to be mentally focused and strong enough that you're going to rely on your technique and your technical skills. When they call for a power series, you're just going to increase your connection to the water. You're not going to go on your own and drop, drop your head and go out a stroke and blow the boat up. You're going to find that power through connection. Okay, so power versus control. Be positive and enthusiastic. I, I don't, I never under, uh, undervalue this. <clears throat> you need to approach your job with enthusiasm. And in your lives, when you're working, and some of you are still working, you, there's people in your lives or in your professional occupation that come into, their, uh, into the office and they really don't generate a lot of energy. They sort of suck it out of you when you're around them because they just sort of mope. Um, easy to be enthusiastic when you're paddling. Easy to have a smile on your face when you're having a good day. The test, the mental toughness test, is can you be that same person when you haven't had a particularly good day? Can you bring it? Uh, sorry. Um, I was just given a note to remind people to mute. So I guess some of you aren't muting and it's a little distracting to, to some of the others. Um, anyway, yeah, the challenges, and I've had that challenge myself, where I pulled into the parking lot getting ready to coach and I'm in my truck. And I remember, and I'd say to Liz, you know, I don't know if I've got it today. Like, I just don't, I'm just tired. And of course, Liz will say, well, if you're not going to do it, who's going to do it? Like, they're counting on you to lift them, to, to create that energy and get them ready for practice. Because they're dragging their asses out of their cars from wherever they're coming from, looking forward to this experience. But it's not just the coach's responsibility. It's your responsibility too. And if you see somebody having a bad day, you know, if you notice that they don't quite see themselves, give them a nod, give them a wink, give them a smile. And you may think this is maybe, oh, that's for recreational or, or novice crews. No, no, no. I use this for the national team. I insist upon it. That's part of my selection criteria is who's bringing that kind of energy to the boat. I've released athletes who have been really gifted, strong athletes, but emotionally and in terms of team, they're a detriment to the crew. They actually, your job as an athlete, make athletes better around you. And if I'm paddling beside somebody that's giving everything they've got and they're encouraging to me and motivating and they're just leading by example, I'm going to give more. I know that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and when you're away, brag about your teammates. They're worth it. If you're on a plane flying somewhere one day, and I hope we all can, and you'll be sitting there in your seat, and your seat, the person beside you doesn't know you, and they look over at you, and they see you've got this goofy smile on your face. And you're going to say, why? Why have you got that smile on your face? You seem so happy. You say, oh, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking about my coach. <laughs> you want to see a picture of him? <laughs> Anyway, okay, um, number six, go to the dirty places. What I mean by that is embrace the tough stuff. It's easy to go out for a paddle, and if you're a big, long, lean person, it's easy for you to rotate and extend, and you just work on that, and, oh, that feels great. Well, what, are the, what is your weakness? What is the part of your stroke that you absolutely drives you crazy because the coach is beating on you all the time for it? Are you hitting the water negatively? Are you, is your head up is your, or is your head down all the time? Focus on those things. Make your weakness your strength. Okay, Anna, can you put yours on mute, please? Anna, can you put yours on mute? Thank you. Okay, so, uh, and it's not easy. When you go to the gym, what's the exercise everybody needs to do? Two of them, legs, abs. But they're critical, do them. You know, it's, it's easy to go and get on the bench and lift all this weight. Say, yeah, really, you know, this is great. You know, good for you. But do the other stuff. Go to those places that you don't want to go to that are your weaknesses and make them strengths. Okay? Um, emotional risk management, I call it. Embarrassment versus opportunity. You might get asked by your, your coach to do something that you're a little uncomfortable with. Uh, in terms of a drill. Uh, it feels weird when I do that. I don't think I look very good doing this. I would rather you risk a little bit of embarrassment and try it rather than miss that opportunity where that, that, that piece, that little drill could take you someplace else. It could be an opportunity for you to get better. 
And I'll tell you a very quick story. When I used to coach uh, hockey, and I coached competitive hockey for, for kids, and I had a group of 13-year-old guys, 13-year-old boys. So you know, boys, when you're 13 years old, you're going through a lot of changes in life right around then. And I had two goalies. It was our last tryout. It was a real competitive team, the most competitive uh, level for that age group in, uh, in the country. And I had two goaltenders. And if you know anything about ice hockey, goalies have got great big leg pads and shoulder pads and chest protectors and big gloves and a helmet heavier than them. Just a ton of equipment. They don't move very fast. Their, their position is just to move very short little, a couple of feet at a time to protect the goal. Anyway, so I got these little kids that have got, their, their arms are like this, their legs are like that. They got this big equipment. And they were the same in terms of all the testing, the, the technical testing, the agility testing, uh, their statistics in games, uh, all that stuff, strength and endurance. There's nothing between them. We had to break the tie somehow. We had to do it at this particular practice. So we brought in two chairs, you know, an audio auditorium chair, and put them back to back, about four feet in between them, and we put a goalie, a hockey stick across them. So I threw a hockey stick about this high. So we separated the goalies. I went up to the one goalie and I whispered in his ear so the other goalie couldn't hear me. I said, I want you to skate as fast as you can and jump over that, that hockey stick. Well, the, he looked at me like I was from Mars. And he says, I, I can't do that. I said, oh, okay. Called the other goalie. You're probably getting a sense where this is going. Called the other goalie over. And I said, uh, I want you to go and jump over, skate as fast as you can towards those chairs and jump over that hockey stick. And he looks at me and he goes, okay. And this kid lumbers along, picking up speed. He hit this explosive speed of about three miles an hour, clumping along on these big skates. And he jumped as high as he could. And his feet were that far off the ice. And he took out the hockey stick, the chairs, there was hockey equipment all over the ice. It was like a yard sale. Everybody in the place was laughing. The other goalie was falling down laughing so hard. Went over to this goalie, picked him up. He wasn't laughing. He was embarrassed, 13 years old, pimples all over his face. That's the last thing he needed. Picked him up and I said, uh, congratulations, you're on the team. What he did so impressed me, especially a kid at that stage in life, to trust the coaches and, and, and to take that leap, thinking they must be doing this for a reason. They wouldn't put me at risk, they wouldn't hurt me. And I wanna make this team, so I'm gonna put myself out there. I know adults that wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. But put yourself out there, take some risks, because I would hate for you to miss an opportunity. That other goalie missed that opportunity, missed making the team, he'll never have that chance again to make that team. Okay, number eight. What do you do when nobody is looking, when no one's looking? And I mean that in terms of training, okay? Just to be clear. Um, practices, obviously, are really, really important. But what you do to prepare when you're away from the boat is absolutely critical. You're not gonna get all your conditioning in in a dragon boat practice. As a matter of fact, if you go to a dragon boat practice and your attitude is, um, I gotta have a really good workout here, uh, and that's selfish. If you're there for your workout, that's selfish. You should be at that practice to listen and learn. And if it's a soft practice and all we do is drift around the lake for an hour working on technical skills, on the catch, your leg drive, really boring, repetitive stuff, then deal with it. Because that's how the crew is going to get, uh, is going to get stronger. Um, so when you're at home, what, what's your nutrition like? What kind of rest are you getting? What kind of training are you doing to supplement? Are you doing things to get strong so that you can execute those practices in a dragon boat? Um, and you can handle the boredom of having a, a, a technical practice. And I'll tell you something, and I know from experience, if you have a pizza and a beer at home, just because your team doesn't see you doing it doesn't mean it didn't happen. <laughs> I should put up a sign laugh here because I can't hear anything because you're muted, but that's okay, stay muted. Okay, coaching feedback, coaching feedback. It's only personal if you choose to take it that way. Dragon boat is such a unique sport. Like I mentioned before, you're one of 20 people in the boat. 
you're going to get feedback in front of your peers. As a veteran athlete, um, talk to the marginal ones, talk to the new ones and the weaker ones and some that might be getting a little more constructive feedback than some of the others. Let them know it's okay. There's, you know, that's, that, that's how the sport is. Video review. Tell me you don't have to have a thick skin when you're being video reviewed in front of your peers and it's stop slow motion and you got a little drool hanging out here and your catch is at the negative angle and you don't look great, but they're using you as an example. You've got to be ready for that. You've got to be tough enough to, to accept that. And hopefully you've got a coach that delivers that and prepares you in the proper way so that you're, you're ready to, uh, to deal with that. I had a, a quick story on that. Had an athlete, my, my best, biggest athlete, six foot 12 or something. Like he was just a huge, huge man. And, uh, and I was in a coach boat beside the dragon boat. And I'm driving along beside it. And it's a great place to coach, by the way, if you can ever do it from the side. And I wanted to get a little more reach out of him. So I was pushing him a little bit. This guy was a leader, raced every race. He was always, he never sat. Um, so I was gonna get a little more out of him. So I kept saying, Terry, I need a little more, a little more extension, a little more extension. Come on, Terry, a little, need a little more extension. Well, this big mountain of a man on the dock after the practice, we're walking down the dock and he says, coach. And I turned, I, yes, he's a big tall guy. I said, yes. And he says, I've never been subjected to such abuse as an athlete in my life. And he was serious. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you're so negative. He said, you just, you just called me out and called me out and called me out. I said, well, that was only because I was trying to make you a little bit better. You were very close um, to, 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 you know, to getting a little more reach, a little more connection in your stroke. So I was just working, just trying to get you there. I had no idea he was so sensitive. Horrible practice, he said. Next practice, I'm thinking, I got to deal with this guy. How am I going to motivate him? Same practice, same thing. I'm on the, in the motorboat beside the dragon boat. What do I say to him? Hey, Terry, looking good today, buddy. Nice extension. Now let's just try a little more. Good work. He wasn't doing it great, but he was trying. After the practice, walking down the dock, what does he say to me? Hey, coach, that was a great practice. One of the best we've ever had. Because I gave him praise. Okay? You got to toughen up. You got to be thick skinned. You got to accept that feedback as a way to make the boat stronger. Okay? As teammates, you need to be sensitive to that. Your job as a teammate, if I were to say to, to Garf, um, Garf, you're going negative at the catch. I'm on him and I'm on him and I'm on him through the practice. As his seatmate, you shouldn't be looking at Garf going, come on, Garf, get it together. You should be looking at him saying, it's okay, Garf, we're with you. Hang in there. He's only telling you that because he knows you can get there. He knows what you can do. You got to be that positive influence. Don't be coaches. Okay. Uh, but if you want to coach, I got coaching clinics. We'll talk about that later. Um, uh, what's the next one? Control your nerves. Uh, control your nerves and, uh, and have confidence in yourself. Do the work, trust your training, trust the plan. This is my favorite story. If you remember nothing else from my presentation, please remember this story. An Olympic athlete, young guy, he was a junior at, at, at the junior level in C1, high kneel canoe in the Olympics. He was ranked seven or eight in the world. He goes to his first Olympics in Beijing. He's expected to, to, get a, to go right from the first race to the final, to the medal, uh, medal race. And he totally poops the bed in the first race, um, has to go into a repassage, goes into the repassage, doesn't qualify for the final. Total disappointment. Comes back to his country, really disappointed. Hires a sports psychologist because he wants to qualify now for London was the next Olympics. Sports psychologist says, okay, ask him a few questions. How did you feel about the Olympics? Oh, he says, greatest experience of my life. I now have a girlfriend in Norway. I love the spectacle, love the opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies, met all these people, did all this stuff. Great stuff. Sports psychologist says, tell me about how you felt just before your first, your first race in the Olympics. And he says, oh man, I'm telling you, I was, I knew I had, this is the biggest race of my life on the biggest stage for my sport in the world. So I knew I had to do something superhuman that I'd never done before I had to do in this race if I was going to be successful. The sports psychologist said, all right, dust it down, 
tell me about your training. How long have you been training for this? Well, I've been training for three years for this. Okay. And how many race pieces have you done? Oh, hundreds, maybe a thousand. All right. And you've got a race plan? Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. He said, then why on the biggest day of your life would you throw your race plan out the window and try to do something superhuman that you'd never done before? And in fact, what he did is he put too much into his start. He blew up. He had no energy for his race. Fast forward to London. He's got his race plan, got a new coach, sticks to his race plan, wins a bronze medal at the uh, London Olympics. It's a really good story. We had this guy come and talk to our team at a banquet once. But the moral of the story is trust all the work that you're doing. Have confidence in yourself. Control your nerves. The sports psychologist said to him, I thought this was really interesting. He said, you should have known going into that race how you were going to finish that race within a couple of seconds. You should have known that. You've done it hundreds of times. You knew how it was going to turn out. You can't control the other guys. Okay. Uh, number 11. Am I running out of time, Tim? Write something down if I'm running out of time. Yes, sir. You're already seven. Are you okay? You're okay. Carry on. It's good. It's good. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm getting there. Total unconditional support of your teammates. You don't have to love them. I wish you would. I hope you do. But you've got to want to see them on the podium. Okay? As a team, as I mentioned, you're as strong as your weakest athlete. As teammates, did I mention the gap control already? Did I mention gap control already in this one? No. Okay. It's a term from ice hockey, gap control. Uh, in Dragon Boat, there's a gap between your top athlete and your bottom athlete in muscular strength and endurance, in technical uh, experience, you name it, there's a gap. What we wanna do uh, as a coach and as a program is I wanna, I wanna reduce the gap from the weakest athlete to the top athlete. Now that doesn't mean you top athletes, we want you to get weaker so the gap gets closer. It doesn't work that way. What we want is we wanna facilitate the bottom ones to get stronger, the newer ones, the weaker ones, okay? How do we do that? Well, that's up to the coaches to develop a program and work with them. But AF teammates have a role as well. you got to give them unconditional support. You can't be the one in the boat that's rolling your eyes or looking disappointed that you see the roster and some of these marginal ones are in the boat. Or if they miss a stroke in practice or they ask a question you don't think is, you think is kind of dumb. you got to remember where you came from and whatever you can do. And maybe this athlete will never be up here. It never will. It's just, it's just not going to happen. But if this athlete gets from here to here, your boat just got faster. If they all get a little bit stronger, you get faster. And the only way that works is if you instill confidence in them. Make them feel like they contribute, like they're valuable. You've got to motivate those guys. Okay, number 12, don't let them poison your mind. Okay? When you're racing, when you're practicing, be organized when you come down to the boat. You know, drives me crazy. We get down to the boat and somebody's forgot their water bottle, forgot their seat pad. I forgot to go to the bathroom. Oh my God, the list, the list is, goes on and on and on. Be organized, avoid distractions, or avoid distraction by being prepared and organized. Okay? That will allow you to maintain your focus. Um, and number 13, I'm winding it down here. Losing, it's a gift. Embrace it. And I'll just <clears throat> tell you a quick story to finish off with that. And that is, uh, I was coaching Senior B uh, Canadian national team in uh, at the World Championships in Hungary. This team was undefeated. It was a dynasty. It was an incredible group of guys. But we uh, ended up coming up against a really strong men's crew from the Ukraine. Now, the Ukraine didn't have a lot of money. We never saw them at other World Championships in Australia or Prague or... <clears throat> Tampa, wherever. So we come across them for the first time. They handed our butts to us. These big men had fingers like sausages, and they were like, uh, but that was their sport. They were paddlers. They were just big men. They weren't, our guys were all sort of gym cut, and, you know. These guys weren't gym cut. These were just barrel chested big men with big fingers, and, <laughs> and boy, could they paddle. They were slow out of the gate, but they beat us every race. But what it made us do, it made us, it, it toughened us up mentally. You know, we had, to, we tweaked the boat. We, we changed the race plan, I don't know how many times. Changed the roster, changed seating plans. And by the time we got to the final gold medal race on Sunday afternoon, the final event, 
the 500 meter race, we came within a tenth of a second of them, but it broke our streak. So we have our debriefing, and the guys are pissed off, and they're 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 having a temper tantrum. Some of them, and they're throwing their paddles and they're swearing. One of our guys comes into the group late, and he's got his phone, and he says, "Guys, just listen to me for a second. I just got." Uh, brought up our uh, race results from the world championships in Tampa two years ago. We were two seconds faster today. We should be congratulating the Ukrainians. They made us faster. They caused us to dig deep and look, you know, resources that we didn't think we had. And that silver medal that we got is one of the most cherished medals that all our guys, including myself, will ever have. So losing builds character. It's how you deal with it. It's not what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. And that's my thing on mental toughness. The absolute last one is have fun and enjoy it. Because if you're not, then, you know, take up knitting. Pick up something else. You're going to have to. All right. So now we're going to Garf. So bear with me while I do this. I'm going to find Garf over here. Okay. Garf, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Catch. You ready? Watch this. Ready. Okay. Takes a while for that ball to get over to Garth. Catch. <laughs> oh, not a good catch. Got a couple of bounces there. Imagine. All right. So. <clears throat> I don't, I don't know that everybody out there knows me, but uh, I've been to uh, Spain and done the uh, data paddle uh, for the, uh, <clears throat> for the <clears throat> effort over there. And I've been to the Tampa camp and I've done probably 300 different uh, athletes at the uh, Tampa camp. Okay, just, I'm going to stop you there for a sec, Garf. Could everybody please mute because we can hear uh, stuff coming from someone. And so uh, we're, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a short course on, uh, on 101 called the uh, Data Paddle 101. And just to show you right behind me here, I've got three data paddles. They're all fixed length data paddles. This one's 48 inches. This is about 49. This is about 52. They basically do the same function, all right? And I'm gonna go through and talk about the purpose of them. Uh, they all have controls. I'm gonna pick this one up and just bring it in a little closer so you can see it a little bit better, all right? So controls are up here. Normally I control this for everybody, every paddler if you've done this before. The other part of the paddle is it has this nice little logo on the front that says face to front. And so this is a one direction paddle. You, if you turn it around this way and paddle that way, the data is, uh, is backwards. It has in the center here, it's kind of the heart of the paddle. That's a set of sensors. It, it uh, records the load and records the orientation of the paddle during the test. So I'm gonna take you through this presentation. So we're gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna share a presentation with you. All right, so we'll start by sharing my screen and bringing up the presentation. All right. Hey, good so, work. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming if, if somebody can give me a thumbs up there that you see the presentation on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Right, so this is uh, be pretty short and uh, part of the Dragon Boat 60 Minutes 2020 effort to keep people uh, informed and uh, educated. So Data Paddle 101, everybody asks the same question. What is the purpose of using a Data Paddle uh, for almost anything but just a paddle? And the uh, I spent a lot of time crafting this particular uh, uh, sentence here, providing feedback to influence the formation of paddling skills that improves a paddle's individual contribution to the boat. 
that's really what we all want to do every time we want to get into the We want to get better. What the data pedal does is it provides you a, a different view, a more detailed view of what, uh, what your contribution is uh, during the uh, paddling uh, effort. What is the data paddle? It's a system. It's a tool set. And it's used to provide the, pad, the feedback to the paddle referencing your style and how much effort or propulsion that you're providing to the boat on every single stroke. How does it do that? It records loads and orientation of the paddle during a series of strokes. I think a lot of you probably have done this. Uh, I, I know I see a lot of familiar faces out there. So what are the components of this data paddle system? First off, it's people. And you see my little, my, uh, my uh, photograph here. It's not quite that many people, but this is, uh, this is, what our, this is from our camp last year. Uh, we had a great time out there on uh, the Tampa Bay. And uh, you, can see, you can see Tim in here. I'm over on this side. And a whole host, but some of you are probably in there. I think Cynthia's in there. Uh, Judy's in there. There's just a whole host of paddlers. We had not eight or nine boats out on that uh, on that water. We just had a wonderful time. Most of the people in that camp got the opportunity to use the data paddle, either uh, the yellow paddle or the black paddle. And uh, again, all, the whole objective is to uh, give you some uh, some feedback. So what the system is? It's paddlers. It's a data paddle coach. That's my job. Dragon boat, steersman, data paddle, software, connecting cords, batteries, computers. So it's not the simple thing that you say, let's just go do the data paddle. It takes a lot of, uh, a lot of equipment, a lot of support to make it happen. And uh, I've been fortunate to be able to do it in different, several different locations across the country and around the world. And uh, it doesn't really take that long once you kind of know what you're doing with it. So the last part of this, data collection. Here's what we're going to, I'm gonna take you through a, a sh real short data collection. Uh, Tim Smith has uh, allowed me to use his data and some video to show, take, you, take you through a, uh, a session. So paddlers are asked to paddle the dragon boat for a specific number of strokes. That number of strokes is, is not that important. Uh, during assessments, I consider 20 strokes a minimum I'd rather do 30, gives you a little more time to settle into your stroke, and I get a, a broader perspective of uh, how, how, you, uh, how you're paddling. Uh, the technique, I tell all the paddles, use your best technical paddling skills. You want to produce your, a consistent race level power during the assessment. So this isn't just go out there for a across the lake paddle. This is give it your best for 20 or 30 seconds. Uh, the key to the whole system now is that the briefing, just because you've collected the data doesn't give you any real feedback. So sitting down with myself or uh, accomplishing the, the debriefing as uh, an electronic conferencing or even an email uh, still provides you the, the feedback. And I've crafted many emails to paddlers across the country when they couldn't uh, make the one-on-one. -on -one. The one-on-one -on -one gives the opportunity to ask more questions. So I, I always go for that one if I, can, if I can make that happen. So I'm gonna take you through a series of graphs, um, an all strokes graph that uh, shows uh, the impulse filled in and little orange bars. And we'll have a little discussion on loads, positive and negative. There's a five stroke sample. We'll zoom in on five strokes and look at the load path itself. See if we can find the kick in Tim's stroke, which is towards the back of the stroke. And we'll also look at a five stroke sample with angles overlaid. And we're looking for consistency of how he handles the paddle through the stroke, during the uh, exit phase, uh, through the transition to the next stroke. We're just looking to see if that's consistent. Uh, sometimes people, um, younger paddlers or less experienced paddlers, have a uh, quite a bit of variation in that in that area, and that's those are just time wasters. So we just try to point that out. 
then because Tim wanted to is is one of those exceptional uh, paddlers that is always wanting to uh, provide the most opportunity for him to paddle. He wanted to do left and right. So luckily, I have uh, the, the system and the software allows me to compare a left side with a right side. And so I have a couple of examples of that. Now, you, you might think, well, gee, I, I can only paddle on the right or I've never paddled other than on the right side. What would it be like on the left? Well, first off, if you've never done that, it's going to be awkward. What's the advantage? If you talk to a coach, he says it gives me the opportunity to put put you in the boat another, uh, at another event. The, uh, the little story I'll tell you though is what you'd like to know is how good are you on the left versus the right? And I know that would be, that was my question when I, when I first started doing this. I wanted to focus on the left because I was a right-hander and uh, I became pre a pretty good left side paddler. And then I switched over to the right. And then I wanted to know, am I better left or right? And the coach wants to know, because I was in, uh, in Hungary and I was uh, going to be on the, uh, I was on a B team and a C team. And uh, coach needed somebody on the left because uh, he had loaded the boat and said, and he came to me and he says, Garf, you know, I really need you to balance the boat on the left. Are you better on the left or on the right? And I knew where, where I sat and I had to tell him, I says, I'm slightly better on the right coach. So it's up to you. I didn't paddle, by the way, on that particular race. But it's, not, it's a nice thing to know. So we're gonna show you how that worked out for, uh, for Tim. So here's uh, what I usually bring up is the all strokes, 30 stroke assessment. And I look, at the, I look here at the load path, which is that black line that goes up and down, looks like kind of a saw. And uh, when I select the uh, stroke mode in the software, it fills that in that area under the curve with what I call the impulse. Impulse is, uh, is a measure of power, all right? So it shows every one of these strokes. It counts the strokes for me. There's 30 of them there. If you wanted to count them, that would be fine. And I talk, I, I, I always tell everybody, everything above the zero line, which is where the yellow, the orange bars start, going to the top of the orange bar, is positive propulsion moving the boat forward. Every little bit of that black line that is below the line where my cursor is and where this yellow circle is, is drag on the boat. Although it's very short duration and very small uh, load factor, there's a slight hesitation on the back of Tim's stroke where the paddle is just dragging in the water. Now you say, well, that's, that's, that's not very important. And it's, it's truly not. Uh, extremely important. But if you think about if there's 20 of us dragging our paddles on a boat at, backwards on, at the same time, we're slowing the boat down and we're not intentionally doing that. What we really want is we want a very flat, clean exit. And I've seen that on very practiced uh, paddlers. So that was that, that part of the stroke that was causing a little bit of drag. So that's one thing I was able to debrief Debrief him on. Are we back to the screen? Okay. So the next thing I did is I zoomed in on five strokes, and my objective was to find the kick. You see where my little green circle is here? That's the kick. That was that final extension of his leg just before he was ready to exit the uh, stroke. And on every one of his strokes, he's got a kick. They're not exactly the same, but on every one of them, he's, he's got that. And it, that takes, that's uh, one of the skills that uh, very uh, practiced paddlers have. And it adds up to 20% more propulsion for a series of uh, 20 or 30 strokes, if you've got that in your stroke. If you just take the paddle out of the water uh, uh, as it's coming past your hip, you won't get that. Uh, you won't get that propulsion, and you won't get that extra twenty percent. So now we're moving along, and I'm going to talk about the angles. All right. So the paddle has an orientation sensor that allows me to show 
the angles. And here, you see my cursor on the orange line, that's what they call the pitch angle. The yellow line is called the uh, roll angle. And I've drawn a blue line through at the top. And what I'm looking at is, if, uh, is that's around the 90 degree point. So I'm always looking at the orange lines to get to that 90 degree point, which as we talked about when we saw the video, it had a very positive angle going into the water. And that's a real plus. And then on the yellow line, I'm, I, I usually look for something in the exit area that indicates how he's moving the paddle. And that's this big dip in here where he's rolling the paddle, kicking the paddle out to the right side. And he kicks it out a little further than he probably needs to. And so his exit is not as clean as it could be, all right? And then when I call it, talk about the exit, where my cursor is right here, that's this little bit of load, negative load on the paddle just at the exit. That can be very flat if you lead with your hip and you get the paddle out cleanly and don't drag it through the water. Nobody wants to do that. So, uh, and now moving right along, to compare his left side and his right side, since I was able to do that on both uh, on that particular day, I'm able to compare the, the, the load graphs. And as you can see, there's not a lot of difference uh, between Pat, his, uh, Tim's left side and right side. And when I brought up and looked at the, uh, uh, the statistics that the, the, uh, the software produces, the differences between his left side and right side are minimal. So when, when Tim gets asked that question, which side do you prefer to paddle on? You go, he goes, coach, there's really not a lot of difference in my uh, contribution on the left side or the right side. I'm equally good. And so, I, uh, I've got that in, in spades that shows up really well in this particular graph. And then the next one is where I added in the uh, angles. And again, I'm just looking, is there a real difference in how he paddles on the left side or the right side? And Tim's a very practiced uh, and very professional paddler and, and there's hardly any difference at all. So what's the bottom line with the data paddle? Basically, it's this last uh, summary. It's a tool. It's up to you to practice, to develop and practice the skills that you're being taught. All the data paddle does is give us another view of what you've accomplished uh, and with the coaching that you received. All right, Pat, I'm ready to send this back to you. All right, Garth, well done. All right, I'm going to stop my share. Yeah. <laughs> ready to take this back? Yeah. <laughs> you ready? I got it. I'm I ready. got it. Here we go. Oh, holy cow. It's on its way. <laughs> what did you hit? It kept. It kept. I'm not on it. I can't. <laughs> you got it? Oh, all right. I got it. Am I the host now? Good. Thanks, Garth. That was uh, that was awesome. I think what we'll do in the future. There's so much information with uh, with the uh, the technical paddle. It's such a great tool. It took a while for me to get sold on it because I'm not a technical guy. Um, but we're gonna try to get uh, we'll get Garth to do a longer uh, piece on it, break it down more. We've got about 45 minutes for those that are that are paddle geeks, the technical ones that are really interested in that. And uh, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Um, wait a second, what's, what's going on behind me here? What's going on behind me? Technical, oh. what are you doing? <laughs> wait, wait, Coach Pat? Oh, wow, wow. Coach Pat, I just wanted to say, uh, Coach, Coach Liz will be here next week. Coach Liz is going to be here next week? Yeah, and Coach Mondrell, too. Mondrell? No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, that's great. Well, thanks for stopping in. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, broadcast, guys. Um, we have a blast doing this. The whole objective is just to keep us together and, and uh, a little bit of a distraction from, from being at home and keep us connected to the sport. Because this day, one day, we're going to come out of this thing. Things might look a little bit different. 
but they're not, the sport is going to be there forever. They're not going to, that, that can't, uh, that's going to be there. So we're going to return next Friday with Coach Tim and Coach Liz and, uh, and Mondrell. Um, and next week, Tim will be your host. Okay. So tell your friends about it. Let's load this thing up and get as many people on this as we can. If you have any feedback, anything you want to share, you can email us. Um, you'll find our emails. I don't know, somehow. <laughs> I'm not the technical guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you for participating today, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, Tim Garf, excellent job today on the presenting. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Take care, everybody. It was great. Thank, thank you very much. much. Excellent presentation. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Excellent. Thank you for taking it. Stay safe. Bye-bye.